we've been having a lot of floods lately, right? With, with the winter, especially back east, Texas, places like that. And so uh, in light of the theme tonight, I, I thought of this little joke. It's an old joke. You've probably have heard it about a flood and, and how this family was um, not leaving their home because they just weren't going to leave their home. And so they started praying, Lord, you're going to have to deliver us from this flood somehow. Just watch over us. Uh, get us to safety if we need to get to safety and so this uh, rescue crew drove by and said hey come on in we'll take you out of uh, out of uh, danger here if you'll just come in with us says no 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 that's okay we're, we're in God's hands don't worry about us the flood water began to to come in and they were moving from the first floor to the second floor and then to the third floor and now they're on the roof and they're just praying God please help us help us and so this boat comes by and says hey come on in we'll get you out of here and they're no 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 God's going to help us don't worry about it and so they're just praying and seeking the Lord and the helicopter comes by and says hey come on we're going to throw a line down get into the helicopter and we'll get you out of here no 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 God's going to help us and a flood came they ended up drowning and dying so there they are in heaven and they go up to God and says God where were you he says, well, I sent you a vehicle, I sent you a boat, I sent you a helicopter, and you didn't get in any of them. <laughs> Oftentimes, God sends us things, and we're like wanting some supernatural fireworks to take place, when God in reality is just using the natural things in life to, to help us, right? Uh, somebody that just comes along and says, hey, I got some extra food, or I got some clothes. Why not? No, no, God's going to provide for me. Well, he just did. So we need to take those opportunities. And, and, and I believe that's what's happening here in this chapter. Remember, and let's not forget this about Jeremiah. He, he's living in a time where the, the people of God are corrupt. They're into idolatry. They've made some bad choices. Okay? Bad choices. They decided to worship other idols besides God like the United States. They, they have decided to offer up offerings and sacrifices to the gods of other nations. They have basically turned their back on God and yet at the same time are hoping that God will deliver them. How foolish that is, isn't it? I'm not calling them fools like we heard on Sunday, but it's foolish to act that way. It really is. Uh, we know that there's one God and this one God is the true and only God and there are no other gods besides him nor will there ever be any gods besides him. Isaiah is very clear on that. And if there is, then we should trust and have faith in him. He is our hope. And we should never turn our backs on the one that can help us in situations that come up in our lives, in trials or whether they're tribulations. And yet, when we make bad choices, and when it's our fault, and oftentimes it's more our fault than it is anyone else's fault, and we can play, blame circumstances, we can blame society, we can blame government, uh, we can blame anyone. But in reality, we made bad choices. And yet, God still loves us. Isn't that amazing? It just blows me away. It doesn't blow me away that we love God. That's easy. But it blows me away that God loves us. And He loves us so much. And He gave us uh, the picture or, or the evidence of that love by the cross. And we saw Jesus hanging there because he loved us that much in spite of us. <clears throat> if you have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about, especially when they're in the stage of rebelliousness, uh, when they don't want to listen and they want to go their own direction and yet you just pour love on them. And I find that to always work. It doesn't mean you're approving of it. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you're going to condone them. Uh, you're going to love them like Christ would love them. And usually it's the love of God that causes men to repent. It's the kindness and goodness of God that brings men back to him. And so we need to continue to, to trust and have faith in God because he loves us. He's the only one that does. So in these new chapters that, that we are approaching here, chapters 40 through 44 actually, uh, these chapters record events of the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem. So at this point here, Jerusalem has been taken over. Babylon has gone in. And now they're gathering up all the rich, prominent people, and they're moving them from Jerusalem to Babylon, and they're leaving the poor uh, in, in, in Jerusalem and so forth. They're going to bring in officials and government, and they're going to begin setting up programs. Um, they're going to begin to rebuild and, and establish their laws and so forth. So it, it's a whole hostile takeover and a whole new society that's going to enter in and a mixing of cultures and so forth. And yet God, through all of that, 
is still in the picture and he's still working. And he's using the government at this time uh, to save his people for what he has in the future. And we know that in 70 years, they will be set free. They will return to their land and they will begin to establish the new temple, uh, rebuilt it. Um, they will literally have a heart to not worship other gods. In fact, they'll go so far to the extreme that they begin to create laws that they do not worship other gods and they completely set themselves apart for God, but they begin to uh, uh, work according to their own hands instead of coming to God by grace and understanding that it's through faith that we are saved in Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> so interesting time. So don't forget this. Now, we're going to be introduced to a guy, a governor, uh, Gila, Gedaliah, who will be appointed governor by the Babylonians there. And he's going to basically uh, take those uh, survivors there and he's going to move them to Babylon and then he's going to create a system for the poor and, and begin to give them land and, and, and they do prosper and we'll see that in a minute here but because he is helping them and there are still those fascist groups out there that don't like Babylon and so forth there's going to be an attempt on his his very life in chapter 41 it describes uh, Gilead uh, his short rule as governor and his reconstruction in there. So God will provide. Boy, we need to understand that. Romans is very clear that, that, that all things work together for good. That's all things, not just some things. And, and not only when you're walking with the Lord and, and you're right with the Lord and you're surrendered your life to the Lord, it also works out when you're not walking with the Lord. He's working things out in your life. Thank God that he, that he has his hand on you and nothing has happened that you are out of the picture because that would be a sad way to go. Uh, but repent, turn back to God. His arms are always open. He's always loving. He's always willing to reestablish you. God will provide. <clears throat> this week I have been um, really, really busy and, and I really need your prayer because I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know what God's even doing, but he's doing something because he always provides and he always leads and guides. And um, everything just seems to be falling into place. You know, I've had this injury for six, seven years and pretty much bedridden to a certain degree. I'm able to come here, uh, teach, and then back home and so forth. I can't even do any yard, I couldn't even do any yard work. That's how much uh, of pain that I would get by the end of the day. But the Lord has been gracious through just time. It's been a couple of years where I have just really watched what I've done and have really not overdone it so that I create a, another injury or a re-injury. And it's helped the healing. I'm now walking every day for 16 minutes and it's just wonderful. I'm able to cut my front lawn, my back lawn and, and blow just everything at once and then I'm doing more here. And so it's just interesting how now that I'm feeling better, God starts using me more. All of a sudden, I'm going to meetings. All of a sudden, I have opportunities. And, and now I'm committed and, and, and so forth in, in these new uh, community organizations. And I'm just kind of like, wow, Lord, you, you are amazing. How, how your timing is, is always perfect. And yet at the same time, the enemy's there. And he wants to destroy and kill. And I was just sharing with the ladies this morning that I've got this lump on the back of my neck here that's the size of a, a baseball and if you cut it in half, that's what's sitting there. And I'm thinking cancer, you know, something like that. But in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, it's just another hindrance, another enemy. I know it's starting to kind of go up and I can feel the pain going up to the side of my head. So it's got some arm reaching out there, grabbing onto something, whatever it is, you know. Um, <clears throat> and in my head, I'm thinking, okay, if I get it removed, which I can, how long am I going to be in bed again? How long before I get up and be able to do stuff? And now that you're doing something, you know, I, I can't afford to, to, to sit back and watch again, Lord. So I'm looking for a healing. So if I can ask you to pray for me, that the Lord would just remove it. It, 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 it will um, get smaller and then all of a sudden it will get bigger. So I don't know what's going on there. Uh, it could be a fatty tissue just in that one, one spot, only place I got some fat. <laughs> just kidding. But, you know, the Lord knows. And, and so the enemy's always attacking. So 
I go to the city, and of course you heard the news, we, we, we get to have a modular unit there. So I go to the bank, I know, yay. I go to the bank, and, and, and there's a guy there that we were talking about it uh, a year ago, and I said, hey, they just approved it. And he goes, great, let me give you a number to uh, my brother-in-law. That's what he deals in. So I got, I got the number, and I'm going to give him a call and find out exactly what we need to do to get a module unit out here. So that's, that's on the works. This is the city just, boom, just, you know, just, just like that. Like God just directed them, and so we're there. Went to the parks, and uh, we needed to do some work there because we adopted the park for this outreach of five weeks. And we went to this uh, meeting where there was a health inspector plus the parks inspectors and everyone just got together and it's been a year to almost two just trying to get this project done and all of a sudden this this new guy comes into the scene and I really believe he's a believer because when he left he said he said pastor give me a call if you need anything I'm going to look into this and I'm going to really work on it I'm going to see where we can cut back and just really get the bare minimum without any cost and so forth and, and so because you never know we might have trials and tribulations you know I'm thinking who uses those words Christians use those words you know so God is just so good and then um, someone stepped up to the plate and they said we'll take care of whatever cost it is to do that uh, that room so the park was like happy when I said that they're like oh well that's nice and so just just that and then from that meeting I went to another meeting that um, Sienna here told me about and then I read it in the community newspaper and it's with sheriffs and clergy sheriffs and clergy i almost didn't make it i just kind of sat in my bed and like, i don't want to go lord i just want to sit here and study and, and so uh the lord just said go and virginia said go too i gotta listen to her <clears throat> so once the lord said and then virginia said i said i better go so i went and um met seven other pastors uh that are in the community they're out in that area and got connected for the Summerfest. Uh, they have events that are very similar, so we may be seeing them there and, and, and get connected. And what the sheriff is doing is trying to uh, create a relationship with the, the police and the churches so that they can get a better image, so that people know that they're just not there fighting crime and trying to arrest people, that there's a lot more about uh, the law enforcement in our community. Now... <clears throat> I'm I'm sitting there and and I'm like nervous as heck because this is the first time I've ever even been to something like that and all these other guys are talking like they've been doing it forever and I'm just Lord why am I here I have no idea why I'm here Lord uh, I don't even know what you want me to do so whatever it is uh, I'm here next thing I know is we'll see you next month or in, we'll see you in two months we'll do this on a regular basis and I'm like now I'm on this committee you know and they're taking pictures and and so forth I'm like okay Lord so I mean just stuff is happening and, and I have no idea uh, what's what's going to happen with it all and so keep all this in prayer uh, this is uh, the city of Harupa Valley connecting with the churches uh, I'm Leary you know me if you know if you've been here for a long time I'm Leary of government sadly to say I'm Leary of law enforcement maybe because of the background I have you know um, I know not all of them are perfect you know, I'm not saying that they're that they're all bad. You know, I'm just saying that I understand humanity and, and that we're all sinners and fall short. You know, and there's pride in all of us. So even after the meeting, as the clergy got together, we were we were all just kind of saying, "Okay, we got this," but I don't know if they really know what's really going out there. Because what's going out there? One one pastor uh, who started a little church in Sunny Sunny Hill, Sunny Hills, I believe it is on north side of the freeway <clears throat> he said they're shooting each other they're shooting each other his son was out and they shot him in the chest he almost died and the lord saved his life but he's there trying to minister to these guys that are shooting up each other uh, the, the other couple of pastors that are ministering in rubido area they're giving out to the community and they're giving out to people that that can't read, can't write, don't know how to fill out forms, and, and they're helping them, they're pouring into them. And, and this is the community that we live in. And yet you have the other aspect of the community, the wealthy community members <clears throat> that are out there too, that are just as important as the poor. <clears throat> By no means am I saying that the poor are not important, but I think Jesus did have a heart for them. And I think Jesus reached out to them, and we see that in scriptures quite often. In fact, I think that he has given the responsibility to the wealthy, or well-off, shall I say, uh, to be um, invested 
in their communities and in those that are less fortunate. You know that the Sheriff's Department did a sweep of the Santa Ana River there for the homeless. <clears throat> in the past, they have just pushed them out of the way, tried to get them to go to the cities. This time what they did was, apparently this new chief and, and commissioner are, are really trying to connect uh, with the churches and trying to reveal that they do have compassion. What they did was they got the names of all the homeless and they identified all the veterans. And they took all those veterans and they showed them they have benefits. And so 18 of those veterans now have assistant living homes. So they're off the streets and they're now in homes themselves. So that's a good thing. I thought that was a great thing. You know, so things like that, that God's giving us these opportunities. Um, just got a call today from a young lady. And actually, I got a call from her social worker. Uh, called me first and wanted me to know that uh, she's going to come out and receive food. And I said, no problem. We normally do it on the first and third, but we'll go ahead and give her food. She has nothing, hasn't had anything, and she needs something now. And no churches are even answering the phone. And so the lady said, I'm surprised you answered the phone. I go, I always answer the phone 24-7. It's, it's by my side. Unless I'm talking to someone else or, you know, doing something at that moment. So, <clears throat> so the girl calls me back and and she uh, says, okay, I'll be out there um, to pick it up. Then she calls me a little later and said, I can't come out. I don't have any gas money. And the person that, that said that they'll take me, uh, they don't want to waste their gas uh, going all night. Though. She's in Paris. I'm like, well, we can't go out to Paris. That's 45 minutes away. <clears throat> then she starts crying. She's, she's, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to put my faith in Jesus I'm trying to do the right things and it's not working and as soon as she said that I said Lord you work you work Lord you you're not a person that does not work so I said I'll pay for the gas tell your friend to bring you out here I'll pay for the gas so that she's not wasting her gas and she goes bless you bless you bless you so God works he does work and I'm not going to let anyone say that he doesn't work because he does work and so she's hopefully going to be here tonight and we're going to just pack her up with food and, and pay for that person's gas for bringing her out here and, and hopefully she'll be able to um, get some more help during the week while she's got food for herself and her, her kids. So it's just interesting how God puts things together in, in our society. God is working and I hope you'll join us because we need help. We need laborers. The, the harvest is plentiful and the timing is right and, and God is doing a work and he's raising up wonderful people to, to, to help and to serve here. Um, compassionate people, loving people that are here with the right motives for the right reasons, wanting to make a difference in our society and in our community here. Of the 250,000 people that the Sheriff's Department service, Harupa is the biggest we have a hundred, almost 100,000 people just in Harupa Valley compared to Eastvale and Norco, which are a couple of other areas that they service too. So, so keep those things in prayer. God will provide. So we see Jeremiah here uh, basically being rescued and given freedom because of this uh, new governor. Let's look at verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after uh, Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah. When he had taken him bound in chains among all who were carried away captive from Jerusalem and Judah who were carried away captive to Babylon. Now remember last week uh, Jeremiah was, was set free but for some reason we see here in chapter 40 that when, when things are going around like that, you know, where, where new government's coming in and people are being deported and, and the poor are being uh, established and given things, there's a lot of confusion, right? Uh, we would call it red tape today in government. Uh, it, 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 you know, go to the DMV. You'll be there all day long. So you can imagine Jeremiah kind of enduring those things. All of a sudden, he's in chains and he's being deported to Babylon. What's going on here? Why am I being deported? God had a work for me and now I'm, I'm being headed to Babylon. And so he's in that situation. But God works through situations. He always works through situations if we put our faith and trust in him. Uh, that's something that um, I think those that are uneducated, and I'm not being negative about it, but maybe they didn't have the opportunity or didn't apply themselves for whatever reasons. It, it's hard for them to trust, to trust. And they can trust God. Even when things don't look like they're going to work out the way they think they should work out, God is going to work it out for your best. And we have to believe that. 
And he's going to work it out for Jeremiah. Uh, Romans 8.28 uh, tells us very clearly the truth. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. James says, but let patience have its perfect work. And so be patient. Just be patient. Just trust in God. Put your faith in him. Let the patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete. God wants you perfect. The word perfect there is mature. It doesn't mean that you're going to be holy and pure and you're going to do everything right. What it's saying is you'll be mature in your relationship with Christ. You'll, you will be able to, to trust him and have faith in him. Uh, you're going to have a sense that He's there and that he'll take care of it. It's kind of like Virginia and our relationship. It's like any relationship, not just ours. Any relationship, when you first meet somebody, it's, it's kind of like you're creating a relationship. So you're not totally vested into that relationship yet until there's been years going by, right? They say that marriages uh, struggle the first five years. And after the fifth year, either they're done or they have grown, they have matured, they have been uh, perfected in a, in a sense because now they have learned e each other what we're about and now we can trust each other a little bit more because I know who you are, you know who I am, you know where we come from, you know what our likes and dislikes and so forth. But when we have this relationship with God who is perfect and who is good and works all things out for good, then we can be confident that he's going to work these things. In fact, James says, lacking nothing if we put our faith in him. Timothy tells us, but you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue patience. So patience, wait patiently for the Lord. That is the hardest thing for us to do, is to wait patiently. Like a little kid, you know, on his way to go buy a Christmas tree. When are we going to go? When are we going to go? Come on, come on. And it's only been three minutes since you told them. Come on, come on. You know, five minutes later, come on, let's go, let's go. And they're doing everything they can to get you going. That's impatience. And they need to be taught patient, right? You say, hold on, go sit down. Like, <laughs> you know, because they want to go now, now. And we're like that as adults. We want it now, Lord. Uh, we want to see you working now. Verse 2, the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, the Lord your God has pronounced his doom on this place. So uh, Jeremiah is being taken away, and this captain there all of a sudden says to Jeremiah, well, I guess your God's pretty much condemned this place. I mean, he's pretty much uh, allowed us to come in and take you guys all. It's his judgment upon you. It was pretty much the culture back then that when um, you went to war with nations, the nation that won... Would, would obviously then begin to glorify the deity that they believed in. And, and so if you were one of the uh, Amalekites or the Amorites, you know, and you go in there and you attack a city or a town, you take it over, and then you say, well, our God just did this for us. you know. Well, this guy recognized that Israel had a God. And so he said, boy, your God really allowed us to take you guys, you know, in, a, in a sense. And I find that interesting that I think the world does recognize that we have a God and that we believe in this God. Even the atheists recognize it. I'll tell you why they recognize it. Because they're fighting against it. If there was no God, and if they truly didn't believe in it, they wouldn't care. They wouldn't care at all what we believed. But it's the fact that we continue to go forward with this God and there are miracles and great works and accomplishments. They don't like that and so they fight against it because there is a God. The Bible says the fool in his heart had said there is no God. That's a foolish man to look at the things around us and say there is no God. Just to look at you and say there is no God because someone created you for a purpose and a reason. Uh, as beautiful and as handsome as you guys are, he created you out of love and out of purpose and to fulfill his plan in your life. And so you have purpose. You have a reason to exist. You have a reason to live on. God wants to use you in great ways. And so now the Lord has brought it, verse 3, and has done just as he said. Okay, there you go. We can trust God. He did just as he said. If Jesus, if God says it, Believe me, it will take place. Because you people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice. Therefore, this thing has come upon you. And now look, I free you this day from the chains that were 
on your hands if it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon come and I will look after you but if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon remain here see all the land is before you whatever it seems good and convenient for you go go there so this guy um, Nebuzardan gives Jeremiah a choice and he says I'm going to let you go I'm going to unshackle you here's God working through this guy he says and now it's your choice you want to go to babylon then go to babylon and i will be there and i will protect you if you don't want to go to babylon and stay here then stay here that's your choice that's your choice you know we have choices right and we make choices all day long we make choices in what we want to eat you know we make choices in what we want to wear uh, some of us take a little longer than what we want to wear to make those choices you know because we want to look just right you know, uh, but we all get choices. We get choices in, in our house and our furnishings. And, you know, we have choices every day, every day. We also have spiritual choices, too. We have choices in the direction that we want to go. We want to be blessed, then we'll be blessed if we go in the right direction. Seek after God. Let him lead us. If we don't want to be blessed and we want to have the satisfaction immediately, uh, sense that feeling of, of accomplishment in our own selves or, or, or that feeling of uh, euphoria because we've done something exciting that's sinful, you know, that you can go that way because that's our choice. And so go the way that you want. God doesn't uh, hinder you. He gives you that free will to do so. But understand, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And so if you sow to the Spirit, Galatians 5.22 tells us, then you will reap to the Spirit. You'll reap good things. And so there's some blessings there. That's a good principle. Seek after God and, and, and He will pour His heart into you. He'll lead you and guide you. It may be rough, but He's still driving that vehicle. Or make a choice to seek after the flesh, to fulfill the lust of the flesh. But again, you will reap the things of the flesh. And, and, and so if you become a part of the world expect to have the consequences that the world has expect that uh, you will be a person that is gossiped about they'll call you liars uh, you'll go and be involved in their drama and all of that stuff and you're going crazy what's going on you know get back to the lord get back to walking in the spirit so jeremiah has a, a choice here uh, whatever choice we make uh, this is what's important uh, make sure that god's a part of that choice right Ask the Lord first. Seek Him. And, and ask Him to help you to make the right choice. So, verse 5, while Jeremiah had not yet gone back, uh, Nebuzadar or Zardan said, Go back to uh, Gidaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shephan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people. Or go wherever it, it seems convenient for you to go. So the captain of the guard gave him rations and a gift and let him go. They even provided for him. That's amazing. And Jeremiah went to uh, Gideli, the son of Ahiakim, to Mizpah and dwelt with him among the people who were left in the land. So he made that choice to go to Mizpah. It's a city about eight miles north of Jerusalem on the northern border there of its territory in, in the land of Benjamin. We know the apostle Paul was a Benjamite. Saul was a Benjamite, the, the king. And so in that area, Jeremiah goes to, to dwell in that place. And God's going to use him there. It's an interesting place. It's a fortified place. They have a fortified wall around it that's about 13 feet thick. And so yet it was conquered and, and most of the other nations around that were conquered and taken to Babylon. So that it's, it, it's the ideal place for him to go to in this situation. So in the midst of this uh, dangerous, disastrous thing, uh, Jeremiah was not uh, forgotten. God had a, a purpose in bringing him back as he's going to be a part of rebuilding uh, Jerusalem. In verse 7, um, Jeremiah then settles, and he settles with this new governor here, Gedaliah, who will um, set policies and set up corporations and allow Babylon to come in and out and uh, deport those uh, children that uh, are wealthy and prospering and get them out of the picture and set up a, a whole new system for them. 
And so Jeremiah gets to be a part of that. And when all the captains of the armies who were in the fields, they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, governor in the land, and had committed to him men, women, children, and the poorest of the land who had not been carried away captive to Babylon. Great opportunity for the poor, right? It's a great opportunity. And when we have a great opportunity, seize that opportunity especially when God opens the door. Uh, you might not know uh, what's behind the door, but go through the door. As I said, I don't know what's coming, but something good's coming. And I'm excited about that. And we're going to see God just do a work uh, in this ministry here. So, Verse 8. Then they came to Gedaliah, at Mizpah, then Ishmael, the son of Nath, Nathanai, Johanna, and Johanna, the son of Kareth, and then all those other guys. <laughs> the guy we want to focus on is Ishmael, not a good guy. Uh, definitely a member of a royal family, definitely a Jew by his name, but he doesn't like um, Gedaliah, and so he's going to be a problem. The enemy is always there. He's always around. There's only one Satan, one Lucifer. And then there's a lot of fallen angels. We don't know how many fallen angels, but there are a lot. And so we deal with the fallen angels. Lucifer is dealing with hierarchies in our governments and so forth. So he's not here, but his angels are here, his demonic forces. And there's always a battle going on constantly so you can always expect battles especially when you go forward with the lord when you surrender your life there's going to be battles and in those battles you have to learn to fight you fight through prayer and you fight through persistence and patience and when you do that uh, the battle gets less and less as you grow never stops there's always battles but but the intensity and the force of them may get stronger but your strength is is even stronger than that because you have learned to trust in God and you have learned that that God is greater than he that is in this world and you can put your faith in him and so they may even get stronger but you have become stronger through uh, your weaknesses he has made strong in us as we mature in the Lord so know that you'll always have battles and especially if you get into the ministry battles are going to come almost immediately <laughs> you're going to be tempted and tried and tested and uh, Doubt may come in your mind, wondering if you're doing the right thing. All of these things that the enemy will just bring in to keep you from serving the Lord. Two things that I've always lived my life by, these two principles. If it's drawing me closer to God, then it's the Lord that's doing this trial or tribulation or allowing it and he's pushing me closer to him if it's pulling me away from god and the work of god the plan of god it's the enemy because he wants to pull you away from god it's just a simple observation of how he works and it's a principle that you, that you can pretty much live your life on if he's pulling you away from the church pulling you away from relationships in the church you know, and I'm not just saying this church, any church, wherever you go. The Lord may lead you somewhere else, but if you're there, if he's pulling you out constantly to live in the world and without the church and without the body of Christ and ministry, that's the enemy. Don't give in to the enemy. You have to fight that. You have to tell yourself, okay, Lord, I'm going to be committed to be involved. I'm going to be committed to be committed to the ministry. Whether it's through support, whether it's through just attending and connecting with people. You have to take the first step. What's the Proverbs that says, you want to ha have friends? Then what? Be, be friendly, right? You want friends? Well, go hide in the corner in a closet and wait for friends to come. Well, they're never going to come. You want friends? Then get out there and make friends. It's interesting how uh, 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 new people have come in and some young people and all of a sudden, just like this, boom, boom, boom. One person takes the opportunity to say, let's go on a walk. And next thing you know, there's... And now you've created this whole network of young people hooking up together. Now they're on a, a diet plan together and they're encouraging each other. It's like, that's how you do it. That's how you get people connected. You know, exactly like that. 
Uh, people are waiting to get connected. They're wanting someone else to do it. You do it. You start calling. You set up a date. You set up a time. Let's just get together. Come on over. Let's sit down. You know, let's just do it. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, is others, because they see that, because we are made to fellowship with one another. God has made us that way. And so if you're the type of person that say, well, there's no one that really likes me and, you know, and there's no one that really wants to connect. No, that's because you don't want to connect. They want to connect. They need somebody to just get the ball rolling, right? And once you get it rolling, watch what happens. And if we can do that with the youth, we can do it with the elderly, we can do it with the, what do you call the middle people? That's me, middle people. <laughs> that would be in, in my case, right? In my 30, 35, 35s? 35 year olds <laughs> so you know um, the enemy's out there uh, and when you create a, a network like that of, of connections and, and accountability and, and so forth there's strength there there's strength in numbers as they say right but if you're left alone um, the enemy is going to have his way with you with the thoughts and, and all of that. So be careful. Get connected. And get Gedaliah, the son of, son of Ahiakim, the son of Sharpen, took an oath before them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans or Babylon. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. So it seems like a good guy, you know, just trying to make the best out of the situation, right, for everybody. And as for me, I will indeed dwell at Mizpah and serve the Chaldeans who came who come to us. But you gather wine and summer fruit and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. So there's prosperity already starting. Uh, harvest is already producing. Uh, things are getting back to a little little more norm. The battle's over. Now they're reestablishing th that they have resources now uh, like the summer fruits and the oils from the olives and, and so forth. And so now they're able to eat a little bit more. Where in the past they had nothing, right? Jeremiah's sitting in a, in a well and they're giving them bread as much as we can give you until you die. You know, we don't have much ourselves. And now God is starting to bless them. Likewise, when all the Jews who were in Moab among the Amorites and Edom and who were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left the remnant in Judah, of Judah and that he had set over them uh, Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphim. Um, then all the Jews returned out of the places where they had been driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah and gathered wine and summer fruit in abundance. Moreover, Johanna the son of Caria and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and said to him, Do you certainly know that uh, Baalis, the king of Amorites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethani, to murder you? But Gedaliah, the son of Elikim, did not believe him. That's what happens in, in the hierarchies you have accusations, attempts, uh, innuendos, and so forth. So, I mean, you can't believe everything you hear, and so this guy just kind of discards it, but this guy really wants to uh, to kill him. So, Joanna, the son of uh, Karim, spoke secretly to Gedaliah and Mispah, saying, Let me go, please, and I will kill Ishmael, the son of Nethani, and no one will know it. So, they're going to assassinate him, basically, behind the scenes, take care of it, you know, maybe... While he's sleeping at night, allow a little snake to go in there and he gets bit, you know, and no one even knows that he got killed or put a little something in his cup of wine and he drinks it and he wakes up, it doesn't wake up in the morning or, you know, just do it, let's do this secret. Let me know, give me the word and I'll take care of it. I mean, I'm sure they had all kinds of ways of taking care of you uh, at that time. So, uh, give me the word and I will do it. Why should we murder, why should he murder you so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant of Judah perish. So you see God's protection even over this governor who is protecting really the children of Israel. When you go to Romans chapter 13, it really uh, tells us there the purpose for government. <clears throat> Read it, Romans chapter 13. The purpose for government is to protect us, God's people. That's the real purpose of government. 
It, it protects us from those that want to destroy us. And that's, of course, the enemy. And the enemy has a lot of servants here in, in the world. So God uses government. And so we should, we should not be too hateful of government. You know, understand it's run by men you know, who are flawed and, and um, don't know the Lord. But there are men up there that, that do know the Lord that are secretly serving him without being too, too bright of a light that it brings attention to them. But they're able to, to use uh, their authority, their position, their places to, to support the work of God. And, and we need to continue to pray for those like that because it does help. It's interesting that um, my son uh, Moses, who's in Nepal right now, <clears throat> he was telling me that um, as they were trying to share the gospel, what they were hearing was there was uh, town members, high members, I believe it was, or, or maybe just members letting people know that if you hear their message, this Christian message, and if you accept it, we'll excommunicate you out of this community. So, so the enemies there working through all of this and yet we, we find too he's saying that there are officials who have accepted Jesus Christ and, and some of their children are helping bringing them in and they're able to preach the gospel so stuff is still happening just like it did at that time verse 16 but uh, Gedaliah the son of Ahiakim said to Johanna the son of Kareth you shall not do this thing for you speak falsely concerning Ishmael 